So the, the topic today is about uh, yeah, regulations. We'll be talking about something that I call, uh, we call the AI software bill of materials. I'll explain what it is and why it's maybe interesting for, for the community and for the AI adopters and how we can bring this notion to the day-to-day -day operations, the machine learning operations, and other kind of thing that we could do. Let's see if I can, I can leverage what uh, I wanted to do. Um, first of all, uh, well, not, not relevant, but I'm Adrian Gonzalez. I'm just uh, part of the Linux Foundation, the Responsible AI Committee, but I'm also working at Microsoft as a data and AI specialist. I teach at different universities, and in general, well, I, I really like these topics. I work every day on these topics, and I try to share some content when I make my laptop work. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm located in Madrid, so this was a short trip. So I'm happy because imagine I'm coming from the United States and I tell that I cannot make work my laptop. Uh, we, we have a new scenario, and this is... Uh, already well known. This is just part of the literature. After that, we'll go to the action. But the new scenario is that uh, typically we're talking about ethics as something we want to do as an organization, as adopters, developers, communities. Uh, and it was mostly based on the notion of morals, on the ethics, on the principles that we may have internally in the company. Um, and then we came with regulations. We have different kind of regulations, we'll mention that, but regulations are those things that are coming from usually governments and that force us to do things in a proper way, depending on what we understand by proper way. So we have this convergence between what we want to do and what we have to do. Then we have been talking on the other panel that we have this notion of AI ethics, responsible AI, trustworthy AI, depending on the organization and depending on the community. We call it in a different way, but basically what we are saying is, we are trying to find a way to do things properly. So that's in the middle, no? We are saying that uh, we have ethics and regulation and motivation, but we find our way, and usually we have what we call this AI governance. This AI governance is a series of processes that we may have within the company or our community to decide what we want to do and what are the processes. For example, if I'm developing a Microsoft, a Microsoft, I'm developing an application, I'm leveraging LLMs, and I'm doing whatever, and I'm creating this kind of architecture here and there, then I have a series of processes that I need to follow because there will be like some way to validate that this uh, kind of application is aligned with the principle of a company, regardless of the company, and uh, also to know who is the person or the group of people in charge of making some decisions. Is this a community-based kind of decision? Are we asking someone from a legal background, from a human background, technical background? Are we having this kind of multidisciplinary discussion? So we are on that kind of dynamics, and depending on the organization, depending on the size, and the available resources, meaning people, but also like technical resources, we'll have a different kind of AI governance. So yes, we have the human aspect, because we are working usually with the humans, the technical, how are we using what kind of systems and models we're using? And then the business itself, what's the interest of the business and what we are trying to accomplish. Now, and, and don't worry, I won't go into detail. I'll focus mostly on the other side, of, on the other part of the discussion. But just for you to understand the complexity of what we are uh, doing today as adopters around the world, is that uh, we have different components. This is like a puzzle. So we are mentioning that uh, our companies may have like some principles, like the Linux Foundation, we have a series of principles, AI principles. We can be talking about transparency, human oversight, respect to the human rights, etc. But then we have the, the new AI regulations. Usually AI regulations will come from different geographies and they will be adapted to the different morals or priorities of the different geographies. Um, European Union, we are very good for or very eager to create regulations and to have regulations before the rest of the geographies. Uh, Canada, with the Data and AI Act, or AI and Data Act, actually. Um, and China, uh, maybe one day in the United States. But by the end of the day, what we have is this AI regulation. And maybe we have like some even organizations that are helping to implement this. Now, at European level, we have the AI office that they created very recently, actually, a few days ago. And then the mini AI offices in the different countries, just guaranteeing that uh, companies are complying with this kind of uh, new regulation. In the same way, we had the data privacy, data protection regulations. 
the GDPR, the CCPA, the uh, C27 in Canada, et cetera, et cetera. We have different kind of regulations that are more focused on the data. So imagine if we are developing, we have this puzzle of AI and data protection. And that depends if we're an international company, then we need to be compliant with all these regulations and different geographies. So this becomes more and more complex. But not only that, if we are, uh, let's say, working in healthcare or finance, et cetera, we are in a highly regulated um, industry and we have a specific relations to healthcare, uh, to patient data, to doctor data, to whatever. That completes the puzzle of regulations and why we need a reference let's say, on the day-to-day -day to understand how to implement this from a technical point of view. Because it's very easy to say we have regulation A, B, and C that will be applying to our company and to our use cases, but how to do it when we are developing uh, in our company. In addition to that, we have what we call the standards. The ISO, the CENELEC, different organizations are creating like a, let's say, universal way in which we should do things to guarantee the management of these AI systems, the transparency, the human oversight, what are the processes. Some of these, for example, the ISO, the 42001, or the ISO in general, that will be something that we agree with and we go there and we try to get a certification based on the principles of what they are dictating and then we pass an audit and we are just trying to validate that we are compliant with that. In the case of regulations, we don't have a choice. We have to do it. Again, how to do this from a technical point of view. So the session today, <laughs> or the remaining part of the session, because I'm not sure what I'll be able to show, it was intended to show you a couple of pieces, uh, a series of elements that will open a discussion. We are not trying to find the, the solution today, but at least open a discussion on how we can leverage this complex context for something that will be meaningful and actually positive for us as organizations, open source organizations. The first one will be uh, what we have mentioned, the AS software below materials. That for sure I can show you. The second one, I wanted to show you how to create an AI agent, well, a copilot or agent, do it, whatever you want to call it, for internal compliance by leveraging the first one, the AS software below materials. If we have a standard on which we say, hey, we want to be I don't know, compliant for transparency on the European AI Act. Can I take that and create our internal agents or internal automations to validate that we're compliant? And then the last part of the discussion and the reflection is just to, to, to open the discussion here in reality, not to find the solution, is if we have a standard that we can use to translate actual regulations that are just paper into something that is meaningful from a coding point of view, we have that and we have our MLOps, LLMOps system, can we put them together to automate the compliance process? Can we actually find a way to automate the information we need to put on this kind of uh, telemetry login, et cetera? And if yes, what kind of building block on the AI generative AI we should be using? It's about the models, about the databases, et cetera. So we'll be talking about the role of AI orchestrators. Now, the... A few months ago, you may know, like uh, there have been like several iterations for the European AI Act for this regulation, and it has been since uh, 2021. A lot of iterations, discussions, the different bodies and European Union, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But some moment we we reached a moment that we had more or less like the 90, 95 percent of the information to know what we need to do at the very least from a transparency point of view. What kind of information we need to put about not only the models, but the AI systems that are leveraging the models. But the still, it was feeling like a very far from the reality, the technical reality that we had. So this as an individual, or also with the Linux Foundation, with the Odisea, with the Observatory, and with some friends from, from Germany, the Applied AI Institute, we said, let's create something that is readable from a machine point of view. So we created a JSON a specification, a JSON file that will translate the papers, a lot of papers, into a JSON file that we can handle for different purposes. That's why we call the software below materials. You know that the software below materials is already a term. We just added the AI software below materials as a, some sort of recipe with all the re transparency requirements for this regulation. Now, if, let me put it here, if I go to Hugging Face, 
because we wanted people to understand how to use this, we say, OK, let's create uh, this repository. And I'll arrive, sorry, this is the Azerty uh, keyboard. A uh, long time ago, I used to use it. Boom. Um, yeah. Oh. Then is oh boy, that you will deserve the wine after the session, <laughs> and I will <laughs> too. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. So as I say, we created this repository, totally open. Like I don't remember the, <laughs> to be honest, the, the license we put, I think like it's Apache or MIT, whatever. But the, the goal of this was to say, hey, you have this repository. We have created a first version. This is likely to be evolving a lot. Uh, take it, continue evolving, find all, this all, all, the, all the errors on this specification, and let's continue the discussion. So. And this repository that uh, you can find it here, you put the uh, AI overview of materials, having faith, you will find it. Otherwise, we'll share the, the, the presentation is already on the website. Um, you have all the description, why this is important, we are focusing on transparency, why not, etc. And here, if we just go to the specification itself, it's just a very simple file. That's something that we can actually read, even if we don't know the, uh, the, the regulation. Now, what we need to know from the regulation point of view is that usually these regulations are looking for accountability. Accountability is usually shared. If you have a provider like uh, Google or uh, Amazon or Microsoft, and then you have that doctor being yourself or your company, there is a piece of accountability on each step, right? I'm providing the platform, you are using it, let's see how do we deal with that. So this uh, regulation is talking about, hey, give me information about the provider. Give me the information about the person in charge. The same way we have data protection officers on GDPR, now we'll have like AI officers or AI champions or whatever that will be the entry door for any company to interact with our organization. Then, hey, give me the, um, the, the specification of the solution you are creating with AI. Not only the model, but also like the description of the system. What is this system doing? Input, output. Uh, what are the, the, uh, the markets that you are going to? Is this European Union? Are you covering United States, Canada, China, etc.? What's your market? And, and this is important because depending on the market and depending on the use case, you will find that there are different transparency requirements, but also the requirements related to the, to the, to the regulation. And is this solution using generative AI? If you use Genetive AI, you have like even more transparency requirements. Okay. Then, if you are in an industry, you will say, "Hey, do you have like a, a an industry that is identified like a highly regulated, and then a use case that identified as a high risk? Are you doing social scoring for bidding in in European Union? Are you doing something for access to justice services to education? That's a high risk from a European perspective. So we are putting all this information here." And then we are doing something that's very similar, in my honest opinion, or humble opinion, that is very similar to what we already do in open source. If you check the Llama models, if you check the, some of the Mistral models, open source, whatever we call open source, I know that we can enter the debate, but uh, these open source models, they are creating the model card, and they are telling you at least we are using this high level information of data set, and, 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 and then the size of the volume information, et cetera. Here, what the regulation is saying is, hey, give me the kind of data, the type of data that you're using. Is proprietary, is external. If it's external, it's subject to copyright, because that's another discussion. Regardless of the kind, are you using text-based, are you using SQLs, are you using images, et cetera, et cetera. So all that is creating some sort of specification of what we're using. Then imagine you are fully open and you are saying, OK, this is the data set I'm using for training, validation, testing. You can put information. You are putting the ownership of this data. 
and then you are focusing on the what's the interaction with the humans, no? Because this is what regulations are about, like how, what's the impact, depending on the on the kind of system. So all these, with all the details of the genetic AI details, the potential use of the solution, but also the potential bad use of the solution, because that could happen, and that's what the uh, regulation is saying. All that could be on the equation. But regardless of this, you as a developer don't really, or do you don't actually care <laughs> about this. Uh, it's a regulation, we have pieces of information we need to get here and there, and then we say we have this kind of target structure that we can use to complete the information, and hopefully in an automated way, right? Because we don't want to be doing this by hand, maybe the first or the second time, but then we have our systems. So the two ways we can use this is the first one, we're saying we can create an AI agent. Uh, how many people know how to create like a mini agent with a, an LLM, uh, Meta, Mistral, OpenAI, et cetera? How many people know what a prompt is? Uh, most of the people, a prompt, a request, uh, like a, a question we send to the, to, the, to the system. If we have like some ability, not only to ask a question to the system, but also to guide on the back and use what we call the system prompt or the meta prompt, which is like something on the back door, we can guide the system and say, hey, you are uh, LLM that is guiding people for compliance, or this is an LLM that is talking about sports, or you are related to Coca-Cola, you are related to a specific kind of a scope. The same way we do that, how many people know what a content uh, window, a context window, or content length is for a model? The amount of information you can put on the, on the, on the input, let's say. And we are talking about 8K, uh, 32K tokens, uh, 128K. We could just get this specification that is, I don't know how many tokens, but probably not a lot. And we could just say, hey, with this, you are, um, yeah, you are an agent. You will be using this specification. And then please ask the questions in a conversational way to whoever is in charge of the, of the compliance exercise of the company and do it in a natural way so they can introduce the information by hand. What I wanted to do was to do it uh, live, just to show you that having that specification is what you actually need to implement this in five minutes, in five minutes in whatever amount of time. Now, the problem is that I need to create my account, or I need to uh, log in. Uh, let me. Do you know any equivalent where we don't need to do a login? <laughs> or the owner of this laptop can do the login here with your own account? Let me check. I wanted to do it with, obviously, with, uh, with uh, open source, but uh, OK, let's do it like, uh, like we can here. Hmm. You are an AI assistant to help with compliance topics within, uh, within the company ACME with focus on the EU AI Act. And then we'll say something like, we are just guiding the, the process, and we are saying, you will ask questions one after other following this structure, and generate, for example, generate the output in JSON. So let's see if it works, because usually I use like a, either Llama 70 in Hugging Face or for a GPT-4.0 in uh, Azure or OpenAI, but I'll just try to do it like this to see if a uh, copilot can help us. Uh, 
this will say that uh, we cannot put so many. Okay. I'll put it like this. Now, ask me questions based on the fields of this JSON file. Okay, this is asking based on the structure of the JSON file because it's a commercial tool I'm not able to customize the way it's asking the questions when I'm using like a Llama or, or Azure OpenAI. What I'm saying is use that JSON file and do the question one by one. And I'll be getting the question, I answer. Getting the question, I answer. So for example, if I say like a provider is, uh, let's say, Amazon Web Services, and then will keep asking questions. And it's going based on the structure of this and the knowledge also the, of the AI Act, the regulation. So this is one way to do it. And it have been more spectacular with my own system. But this is already showing that we have like a reference format. We can try to implement the transparency requirements. And we can do it in advance now, because the implementation of the AI Act or any regulation will go towards 2030, maybe. And uh, we don't need to do it today, but it's good to, to start with that. But then the last part of the, maybe of the discussion, and I'll be jumping here to just go to a point, is that uh, we can actually automate these kind of things. We have the JSON file, yes, it will continue evolving. We have a purpose and what, why we are doing this. And that indeed, we have this similarity with what we are doing already with the model cards. So the open discussion here, and I, um, I just want to get your thoughts also on this, because I assume we have still a, a bit of time. And uh, I think that it's an important question is, based on what we are doing in Genetive AI today, in which we have models, vector databases, AI orchestration engines that will usually connect the sources and the models, we have the rest of the architecture, all the content safety pieces, etc. If we focus on the AI orchestration engines that happen to be all of them open source, Langchain, Semantic Kernel, Olama is open source, right? Just uh, to confirm, yes. Happen to be open source. Do you think that we can leverage this kind of technologies for compliance topics? And if yes, how? Or why do you think that's the case? Anyone wants to take it? Offer? Wanna save me? <laughs> <laughs> so imagine you have an architecture, you have your front end, this is connecting to a backend, the backend you are connecting to a model, the model being Mistral, uh, Gemini, whatever model, OpenAI, Anthropic, etc. And this is model is able to identify the intent of what you are doing, and based on the intent, it's sending the information to a piece called the AI orchestration, and this AI orchestration is redirecting the question, knowing that if I'm asking about the statistics, I need to go to my SQL database. If I need to go to uh, information that is documented on my website, I'll go to a website, I could go to the PDS, I could go to any kind of source. But that brain behind it is what we call the AI orchestration engines. This is what uh, uh, projects like Landchain, Semantic Kernel, Lama are doing. But the most important thing here is that these pieces of orchestration are already incorporating what we call, well, like what we all call login and telemetry. We have already this mechanism. We have Lang and Smith, for example. We have in semantic kernel the telemetry. That's my own opinion, like the big opportunity to converge between these kind of open source elements that we are using already for Genetive AI and what's coming next with regulations and standardization. Because if we had something as simple as this AI software below materials, we can just inject it there. We can adapt it, obviously. We could do the same for all the regulations of their standards around the world. We can put it at that target kind of format, and then we can automate the information collection. 
So this is more or less in a very uh, dramatic way that we have had <laughs> today. But I wanted to show, I have a skip power of the content. You have reference of why the AI so what real materials and what it is and how to use it. But did you have any question before we go to have some drinks, one or two or three? Uh, <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's like uh, a lot to think about. But don't you think that all in all, especially with the current state of affairs, right? Uh, basically, any regulation that will be imposed wherever will have a long time till it's uh, actually implemented, till all the checks are in place, till all the regulatory bodies are in place and have some. Uh, ongoing practice of implementing that. Mm. And by the end of that, which will take years, uh, it will only be applied to several like large-scale corporations, as is the situation with a lot of regulation, actually. Mm -hmm. So maybe, <laughs> maybe your question from this particular slide is not exactly relevant, because big corporations tend to not use like actual open source in their production or in their like in their runtime. This is more of a smaller scale startups, uh, enthusiasts, etc., etc., etc. And everything else is like on a large scale of things. Everything is re-implemented. Everything is doing their own stints, uh, their performance optimizations, like edge cases, etc., etc., etc. So uh, why why do you think that open source? Uh, which is targeted to a smaller scale audience, like in terms of uh, whatever the runtime they have, mm -hmm. is relevant at all to what's ahead uh, mm -hmm. in time in terms of compliance. So the the first level of the discussion will be: Is open source even like uh, included on the on the regulatory requirement? And there was a long discussion on that. Like, is open source? No, there's an exception. Maybe yes, if it's a critical use case, if it's using a technology general purpose and it's related to a use case that is uh, on risk. So that's already one part of it. Are we affected if we are thinking from an open source? community point of view by the regulations, or we are making the most if we kind of align what we are already doing with the model cards and all the transparency things. So that's the first one. Then it's, it's, it's interesting what you mentioned, no? the big company won't be affected by that. But in reality, yes, um, models can be like a mix of proprietary and open source. But you see all these, all these uh, frameworks or data frameworks, sometimes we call it differently. Semantic kernel, for example, is from Microsoft but they directly put it as uh, open source because they know with no open source, no community will grow around that, no contributors, no adoption. Langchain is purely open, sh open source. Any kind of uh, a uh, agent, uh, rack pattern that we see on different kind of implementations, even on all the open source and closed source, source they're relying on Langchain. More stable, less stable because it's changing you know, the capabilities all the time. But from Microsoft, I see examples from Amazon, from IBM, from Google. So I think that they will be relevant. And um, the interesting thing is that, oh, I think that's interesting <laughs> for me, uh, when we're talking about regulation and standard, we are talking about the use case and the system as a whole. So maybe we have things that are proprietary. Maybe we'll have, essentially, we have things that are open source. It's like uh, the example with, um, I mean, Google and Kubernetes, for example. Like some pieces will be like that in the system. So it will be relevant for everyone. Now, coming back to the question of is this relevant for open source organization, bigger or smaller? This is, this is Adrian as an individual saying this. I think that it will be very easy for big companies and corporations to adapt to that. This has a, a cost, obviously, uh, for compliance. If we want to adapt to GDPR, if we want to adapt to the AI Act, we just need to, to make it happen, but it has a cost, which is more affordable for a big company than smaller companies. But the smaller companies, at the same time, if they can leverage, and that was a bit part of the, of the motivation of this talk, if they can leverage something like uh, data frameworks like this, or they can leverage the AI software with low materials, it is already part of the work that is done, will solve part of the pain to be compliant, at least from the transparency point of view. 
then there are things like human oversight, there are like uh, uh, interpretability, et cetera, et cetera. But at least this part, that is the common part for any regulation framework like the NIST in the United States uh, and uh, standards like the ISO, CNLX, the transparency one, I think that it's easy to solve with these kind of pieces. Relatively easy to solve if organizations want to do it. If, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, the Linux Foundation is developing a standard for RSBOM, which is called SPDX. Uh, SPDX3 has just been published, and there is an AI profile. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are like at Karen and different people working on that, and we have had discussions. This AI software below materials was like a very let's say like an um, ad hoc kind of effort to say, hey, we have the AI Act, let's just put the requirements, let's go deep dive into this regulation and this specific requirement that is transparency, which is one article only of the AI Act. Then the SPX, for example, is an effort to create like all the, the wall specification to map all the different pieces of information. It's a bigger initiative. It's an actual initiative because this is not even an initiative, it's just an ad hoc effort. And this, in the best of the cases, we're talking how can we maybe get some insights from this kind of software video materials to bring it to this SPX. I'm not a part of the SPX initiative, but I have been talking to them because of this kind of uh, convergence with that initiative that I think that is wonderful what they are doing. Thank you. Welcome. Any other question? How many people you think you can take uh, this free specification and use it to create your own either agent or transparency requirement when you leave this room in five minutes. <laughs> None of you? Well, I'll show you, I'll be sharing some, some material later. Well, thank you very much. I know that was an unusual kind of uh, setup and we have been changing a little bit the approach, but I appreciate that you stay here right before our cocktail. So please enjoy the rest of the evening.